This is my game controller. There are many game controllers like it, but this one is mine. Without me, my game controller is useless. And now for a taste of things to come. It's time to step up your game. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! You're listening to Game On. Welcome, Punch! Your inside track to gaming and fitness. Of course! Mamma mia! We We've got interviews one-on-one with your gaming experts. Hi, folks. This is Jim Cummings. This is Courtney Taylor. This is Duke Nukem. And we'll help you keep fit along the way. It's time for the moment you've been waiting for. Get ready, because Game On starts now. Game On! Game On! Game On! Hello and welcome to another edition of Game On right here on GameAndTrain.com. I'm Jeff Johnson, your host for Game On, and this is a pretty exciting week because this is our special Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles week. God, I love that tune. Anyway. This week, we've got some special guests joining us from big parts in Turtle history. An exciting guest is joining us right now. He's the voice actor behind such roles as Captain N, Claude C. Kenny of Star Ocean EX, and Kira Yamato of Gundam Seed. And if you grew up watching Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, he was Raphael in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3. He's also a marathon runner, and the co-founder of Run for One Planet, an incredible 11,000-mile journey running throughout North America. Joining me on Game On today is Matt Hill. Matt, how are you doing today? Well, hey, wow, what a what an intro. Thanks a lot, Jeff. <laughs> Great to be here, my friend, and uh, Happy New Year to, to you and all the listeners, and doing great. Oh, that's fantastic. Matt, I've got to say, that's quite the amazing resume you have there. I'm looking more at your first feature roles. I'm thinking Captain N. Was it easy for you to get into this role? Absolutely. No, that's that's a, that's a great one because, you know, really that was the one that was the, the catalyst, which definitely got me, you know, into the world of voiceover and cartoons and sort of really lighting that fire of going like, oh my God, I, I'm getting to go and do this for a living and getting to hang out with, you know, people that I've become great friends with. And as we started to, you know, go along, hearing kids, whenever you get to meet them saying like, oh my God, that's my favorite show. And and then now even 20 plus years later, you know, I still can't believe actually the, you know, the staying power that it's had, you know, and I mean, same thing with like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I don't mean to say it's the same level, but it's the same sort of reach that say like the Beatles had. That every once in a while, there's these iconic characters, I think, that, you know, resonate with, with people planet-wide. And it's really cool. I feel very, very blessed and excited that I've gotten to, to be the voice and sometimes the actor inside the suit in terms of the Turtles for doing all this stuff. Right, and I'm glad you mentioned that because here's one of your more notable roles. And most people probably wouldn't even recognize you for it since you were donned in the shell of Raphael in TMNT3. Yeah, actually, the funny thing is, is those who know me and know I have this kind of like funky walk. They say I walk like I'm six foot four. I'm actually five, five and a half. Those who know me, they could tell from inside the turtle suit that when I walked, they were like, yep, there's Maddie. And, you know, just all the sort of like the different, you know, affectations that I that I bring to it and stuff. But yeah, that was, I mean, you know, hands down, kind of like what Captain Nintendo was for, for voiceover. And getting into the world of cartoons, doing the turtles, it was like a whole new sort of launch into the stratosphere as you were. Because, I mean, we had to train for it for almost a year. I trained with the guy who played Michelangelo, who was who was actually the, the stunt version of Michelangelo. He lived in, down here in Vancouver. So we trained together, doing flips and kicks. And, you know, I got beat up by him basically for, you know, like I say, six months solid. So I could take a hit pretty good when we started filming down in Oregon. You know, it was four months, seriously the most hot, intense challenging role that I've ever put myself into because every day we were acting blind, deaf, and dumb pretty much, you know, I mean, 
you know, if you could see some of the outtakes and some of the walls that we hit because we couldn't see anything as we were trying to exit a room or something, <laughs> you know, ditches that we fell into and oh, all sorts of stuff. But like it all, it, it was a magic experience. And I still can't believe that I still get asked to go and meet fans that it, it seems to continue to take on this life. And, you know, and obviously as the new Inceptions come along with the new Turtles series that they've got out, it just regenerates a, a whole new generation. So it's, it's, again, it's a really cool family to be part of. Now, with these roles serving as a catalyst for your career, you've done your share of voice acting for video games, anime, American cartoons. What roles would you say have stuck with you the most or are the most memorable to you? Yeah, that's a good one. Because, I mean, like you say, I've been very blessed living in Vancouver, especially getting to do a, a ton of cartoons and, you know, from all the different genres, you know, I mean, like say Captain N kind of started off the American, if you will, cartoons. And then there's a lot of anime that was done here for a long time. And, you know, and still is that I got to be part of. I'd have to say, though, if there was one anime show that I did and it was this little dude, this little mouse and his name was Kiro. And he talked like this. And I, I kind of thought that when I auditioned for it, that, you know, he was kind of like Joe Pesci. And so I kind of modeled them after that. And uh, again, some of the outtakes, we can't really repeat some of the language that I'd use, but that was really fun to play that. I'd say probably the kicker for, for all of them would be getting to play Ed on Ed, Ed and Eddie for the nine years that we did on Cartoon Network. And again, one of those characters that just hit at the right time. And same thing, you know, kids that are now young adults that would say how much of an impact that Ed, Ed and Eddie had on their life, like the good and the bad kids that just had a great life that enjoyed it even more and kids that maybe had different struggles that they had to meet as they were growing up. And I heard time and time again, how much Ed, Ed and Eddie just gave them a great, honest to goodness laugh, help them forget about their, their problems or, you know, really help them realize, wow, you know what? I could maybe do something like that. So it's kind of cool because I, I can't believe it, Jeff. I'm on year 25. If you can believe it, I'm getting to embark on what really truly feels like a whole second career going on year 25. I just got my working papers for the States. And so it's kind of neat to be expanding. I mean, I've already been working in America through the other shows that we record here, but it's just nice to be able to play in sort of like the North American arena, if you will, you know, like this, being able to do this radio show on Skype and having the opportunities to reach people around the world. That's what I get excited about. Now it's just like, okay, let's just reach as many people as we can. And <laughs> keep doing great work and see if we can keep inspiring young kids and, and kids with big young kid hearts that, that might be a little bit older in age, but get everybody to keep being inspired to know that they have great lives as well. And hopefully with anything that I might be able to do, if that helps them, like I say, get through a great day or make their life better too. To me, it's a, it's a win, 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 you know? Right. And looking at a character like Ed in Ed, Ed and Eddie, this is a character that you've had to reprise a few times in different mediums. What's the biggest challenge for you then that you face in taking on a character role and coming back to it years later to reprise it for another medium? Um, well, uh, my buddy Ed, um, he is very, very much special to me in the, and so, um, even though it has been a couple of years since we did our show, he seems to come and join me whenever I want. So, um, I'm very blessed because Actually, just a couple of days ago, me and Sam Vincent, who played Double D on the show, who's one of my bestest friends in the whole world, we were on a different radio show, and we literally hadn't done Ed and Double D together for, well, since 2008 was the last time that we recorded the show. So it was amazing. We literally, it was like no time had gone by at all. We just jumped into this thing and kind of went off for an hour and a half. <laughs> So it's neat because I think it's it's like any character or any experience that we get to, to do. It's kind of like riding a bike, right? You may get off the bike for a while, but when you go back to it, you you go, oh, my God, I know how to ride. If you were a kid that liked to jump things, you know, before you know it, you're jumping sticks again. And it's the same thing with, with any of the characters that I play. It kind of feels like this posse of these cool characters that I've gotten to, to be able to, to be a part of. So, like I said, spread, you know, inspiration and good old fashioned good times for kids and big kids. So that's, that's what I get excited about now seeing how this whole cat, you know, this posse can sort of now take everything else into the next chapter, if you will. And I'm glad you brought up Sam Vincent there too, because here's somebody that you've act with in Ed, Ed and Eddie. And of course in Gundam C too, as Kira and Atherin, what's it like to work with somebody that, like you said, lifelong friend, good friend, 
and you get to work with them on a regular basis. Yeah, we have a cool, I think we call it the voice actor code. No bitching allowed. <laughs> Because we realize, like, and I'm not kidding you, and maybe this is just Vancouver, but I doubt it because, you know, the people I get to work with in other cities, it's the same thing. I think in the voice world, especially, and, you know, maybe you find that in radio, I don't know, it attracts really great people. And I think we've all realized, especially working here in Vancouver for as long as we all have, that one, look at the opportunities we get to, to have, and we have the best job in the world. I mean, we get paid great, dude, and, and we get to go and be crazy and some days you don't even have to take a shower if you don't want to just show up and bring an extra thing of deodorant and hopefully you don't bother your neighbor but these guys are my they're my posse and my community and we've all been to weddings together i've i've emceed a bunch of their weddings and you know we've baptized their kids and unfortunately we've buried a couple as well but that's the stuff of life right and you know i think that's where it's neat to be able to look at that now and and be able to to really embrace going okay wow Let's let's make this like the best ever. I, I think that you would agree, Jeff. It's it's kind of like why you probably do your radio show, right? It's like it's your way to go like, hey, I love doing this. I want to connect with my with my listeners. Let's let's see what we can do, you know? And uh so I'm yeah, I'm just grateful to be part of it. So thank you for asking me. Oh, you're very welcome. And I totally agree with you there. It's a love of life, a love of enjoying what you do. And for you, you've also got as if your history as a voice actor wasn't enough. You're an accomplished athlete with an affinity for the track. And we'll have more on that when we come back. Stick with us. More Matt Hill right after this. You're listening to Game On. You know what they say when life hands you lemons. Do a barrel roll. And when you want to know about your favorite games, listen to Game On with Jeff Johnson on GameAndTrain.com. Game & Train is proudly supported by Gamma Labs. Be sure to watch the Game & Train website for upcoming reviews on Gamma products, as well as giveaways, giving you a chance to win some great stuff. Check out GammaLabs.net today. Gamma Labs' mission is to develop safe, highly effective, and all-natural supplements that establish a rock-solid foundation for peak athletic performance and healthy living. Gamma Labs, we're real athletes, just like you. Hi, this is John St. John, but you might know me better as the voice of Duke Nukem. And you're listening to Game On on GameAndTrain.com. Rock and roll. You're listening to Game On on GameAndTrain.com. An exciting week this week, and we've been speaking with voice actor and actor Matt Hill. Now, we've talked about Matt's acting career. We've talked about his career as a voice actor, but now we're diving into a lifelong passion of his, running. Matt. What inspired you to hit the track? Well, you know what? If you were able to talk to my 85-year-old mom right now, she would say that that kid came out and almost a month and a half early and pretty much hit the ground running. I, I think I skipped crawling. Yeah, I mean, as far as I can remember back, I would get in trouble for running everywhere because, you know, I mean, the, the classic, you know, when we're at a restaurant, your dad says, you know, now walk to the bathroom. And as soon as you get around the corner, you're like, you run down the hall as fast as you can. And I had a couple incidences like that where I, I hit waiters with, you know, trays full of food. And in all honesty, I've always had these really cool, what I call sort of angel coaches around me. One being my dad, who is probably one of my first ones. And then my very first track coach back in my elementary school, if you can believe it, I begged them for days to let me join track and field a whole year early. I think it was only, you know, you're supposed to be in the fourth grade, but I asked if I could join in the third grade. So they said, oh, okay, you can try. And I got my butt whooped in the very first race. And, you know, I was totally discouraged. I didn't want to do it again. And, and my coach, she just said, you know, she's like, well, why don't you just try it one more time? I'll take you down to the start line and I'll run as fast as I can down to the finish line. And so just try it and see how you feel. And I'll never forget that because I ran down that track as fast as I could and I actually won the race. And it was a really cool metaphor for my life, you know, to be able to say, okay, you're not always going to win every race, but if you always do your very best, no one can ever take that away from you. And it always leads to something grander, whether it's in the moment like that where you win the race or whether it's the character that you build, you know, by winning a later race or having to overcome something or in the case of, I guess, about what, four years ago when we ran around North America, I can't tell you how many times I pulled from memories of literally running laps around my, my hometown when I was a kid and all the different areas and times that I had to meet challenges. And I'd be halfway up a hill in Northern Ontario and I'd be like, oh, okay, this is just like when I was 10. Okay, 
come on, man, you can do it. Just one foot in front of the other. And sometimes I thought I was going half crazy, but I just realized that that's what you got to do, right? It's why for the Run for One Planet Tour, small steps add up became the motto. It's kind of my metaphor for life now, really. Right. And with Run for One Planet, this amazing cause definitely put your feet to work. What really made you hit the ground running with this project? You know, in, ha, it's, it's such a good question because I can honestly tell you it's taken four years since coming home and two years before that because we what we decided to do the run, I have to take responsibility for actually conceiving the idea. It hit me when I was on an airplane actually at about 27,000 feet in the air because I'd been asking questions about how could I, you know, really give back with my running in a larger world sense other than just sort of, again, signing up for another marathon or signing up for another Ironman, I, I really wanted to do something that not only really helped me express my desire to make the world a better place, but also do it in a way that was true to, you know, how I like to show up in the world. And for me, it's a pair of running shoes and a dry fit shirt. And this wonderful message of if we take care of ourselves and we take care of each other, there's a lot of the time that then has us taking care of the planet. And so Run for One Planet was kind of born and, and a wonderful friend, you know, Steph Tate, who, who co-founded it as well and did so many hundreds of hours. And I mean, really, we calculated, we, we both probably invested about 10,000 hours of running and planning and training and then actually executing 18,000 kilometers and 30 pairs of running shoes and, you know, 22 million odd steps. And But it was neat because... Every time like that, I look at the number and go like 22 million steps it took to go around North America. But then you literally couldn't have taken that last step without deciding to take the first step. And that's why for me, it's, it so goes back and forth between sort of like the macro and the micro, not only in your own life, but then when we sort of look at, okay, how can we make the, the world a better place? Okay. It starts with yourself. Just take one step. If it means you want to feel better, then feel better and then take a step forward. You know what I mean? Oh, no question. But honestly, this is absolutely incredible. Competing in 420 marathons. Some people just aspire to accomplish one or two or three. So 420 marathons throughout the course of this. And you were even recognized by Vancouver's mayor. I like how you say competing 420 marathons. You know what it really was? It was competing 420 marathons with yourself. Because it was this constant battle between, you know, like absolute fatigue part of your brain and your body going like, come on, man, just stop. And then that part of your heart that knows that every single step you take will get you to the next town or in some cases, literally, it will get you to the next step. And then eventually the RV would show up in the distance and might be able to get my, my protein shake and, you know, get some calories back in me. But or whether it was knowing that there was a whole town of kids that were waiting for us to come and talk to them, you know, I mean, it was really, it was very, gosh, I dare say the word, it was one of the most human spiritual experiences I could ever have asked to go through. I think probably the only other one that'll be probably close will be witnessing my child being born. I think it's probably that light between a total miracle and totally like, oh my God, this is happening right now. Because that's how Room for One Planet felt. I hope I'm describing it right because everything all the way from, you know, the marathons and the people and the when people are inspired because they see somebody reaching higher than they allow themselves to go or they just see people doing what they say they were going to do, I think that also brings out the best in people, right? Because that's what we found everywhere we went. It, people were reaching out to us saying, thank you for doing what you're doing. But all the while, while they were also taking care of us or helping us out. And that I, I think it's the same thing, like to me getting recognized by, you know, our, our mayor and, you know, having run for one planet day as sort of a all encompassing recognition. To me, it wasn't about us. It was about what that represented. and. You know, every year that that comes up now, Run for One Planet Day, to me, I share that with our team and I share it with every single person that we came into contact because in my eyes, that's that's what that was all about because if you're going to inspire a continent or if you're going to inspire yourself, you need to have great people around you and it's um, you know, it's what this is all about, right? No question. And with something like this, the legacy of Run for One Planet lives on just with the amount of money that was raised through this event and also just the lasting memories that was had here. And my feet are absolutely physically changed for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had some pretty ugly feet before, but woo, Nelly. Whenever I talk to kids, I, I always, you know, I, I, I ask them with intrigue, do you guys want to smell my feet? And, you know, and half of the school's like, no, the other half's like, yeah. So 
It's a, it's good fun, but thanks for asking because I'm not kidding when I said it's it's taken me four years of of actually being off sort of like officially the Run for One Planet Highway, but it changed my life. And at the same time, I know that everything I'm doing now has that included in it, which is I guess that's what you call a legacy. I guess. And once a year, with the money that we raised, we invested with an organization here in Vancouver called the Vancouver Foundation. And so they're our charitable partner. And so it's great because every single year we get to grant an elementary school across Canada a green dream. So, you know, for instance, last year we granted a green dream to a neighborhood beautification on the downtown east side of Vancouver. They needed money, you know, in order to sort of inspire other organizations to help them with their project. So it was great for that. And then the year before that, we we got to help, you know, an elementary school out in Coquitlam start an organic box garden, you know, to teach the kids to make the food connection, you know. And so it's great because now every single year that gets to happen somewhere else. So my hope is that, you know, the legacy continues to grow and grow and grow. And the more money the legacy makes, the more money we can give out to Green Dreams. And I never thought in the history of this show I would have a voice actor and marathon athlete Talk to me about asking kids to smell his feet. <laughs> hey, man, you asked Gretzky, didn't you? <laughs> you did, didn't you? you oh, no, not at all. <laughs> yeah, well, it's true. You know, you can even ask my girlfriend, Kate. She has to deal with my stinky feet. In fact, actually, I just came back from a couple-hour run around here, and I, when I can smell my feet, I know they're bad. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, this has been awesome. Thank you very much for joining us today. Dude, you're so welcome, man. It was my pleasure. And uh, best of luck with everything, Jeff, and, and your show. And if you ever need anything else again, I will gladly port this up, mate. And we will be glad to have you. That was voice actor Matt Hill. I'm Jeff Johnson. You're listening to Game On.